happy Thursday, PSW staff, clients, friends joining us. <sighs> okay, we're gonna kick it easy today because we've had a, a pretty, pretty big week. I mean, Deer Hunter was heavy. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna lie, but it's in, it's important to to see works of art. You know, very provocative works of art sometimes to analyze them as we try to do um, in a non-judgmental way. And then also with Stephen Foster, um, some of those songs were very nice, but of course brings up issues of racism and all of those things. So we looked at war, racism, some uncomfortable subjects, but um, not our place to judge, our place to just be, um, and part of learning is learning about uncomfortable truths. And that's what I try to say in some of these classes, not, not to be provocative, just to be provocative, but to expand our, our horizon, expand my horizon at least too. So um, that's why I think it's important to look at these things. To, to broaden our, our knowledge of the world and sometimes of the atrocities and the injustice of the world so we don't repeat these things, so we don't cancel these things because we have to know where we, we're coming from. So, um, so I thought, like, let's do like a, a really good revisitation of a Hollywood legend. This guy, such a visionary, coined the term um, makeup because it was cosmetics before you know, cosmetics. But uh, I say this in the class, good timing, because from that transition between the, the stage and then into movies, they needed some guy to be like, who's gonna make our artists look beautiful? So uh, I'll talk a little bit afterwards, but let's re revisit the great Max Factor. <laughs> Factor, if uh, the first time I saw him was at the end of the I Love Lucy episodes, it, his name would always come up. And, um, you know, as a kid, I just, for some reason, it's a good, it's a good name. Um, I think it's a little bit better than Maximilian Factor Watsovitz, um, you know, a little catchier. But he was a visionary makeup artist, wig maker, and inventor, really. And he was known for creating the signature looks of, of the heir's most... Uh, Famous icons, the beauties, uh, the males too, but mostly the females, the um, Ava Gardner and Marlene Dietrich and Jean Harlow. Um, their look is because of his, him, really. Uh, and he believed that glamour should be within reach of all women. So um, he was a, a ladies' man. I mean, in a, in a different way, in a way that he he thought glam you know if if glamour is available glamour should be used and makeup should be used he coined the term makeup it wasn't called makeup before it was cosmetics and um makeup was kind of attributed to kind of just the kind of raunchy theater thing but but uh he uh, yes i'm gonna say it again elevated <laughs> um and and made it something he, he coined the phrase makeup so um I mean, this guy was poor. He came came from Poland, 1877. Um, ten kids. Uh, was too poor to read and write, but um, he did uh, help uh, work at the at the Russian Opera and um, get a lot of experience. When he was, I mean, even at the age of nine, he was apprenticed to a wig maker uh, in in Poland, and he also worked on cosmetics uh, for Russian nobility. So he. He kind of had a cool job, but he was a slave there, he said. Um, they, and he was kind of used as a slave to make royalty look great with wigs and makeup and all this stuff. Um, but he wanted to get out of there. I mean, like many people, America was a place for opportunity. And so um, uh, 1908 comes to the city you love, Lloyd loves, John loves, I love, Los Angeles. <laughs> And opens up uh, uh, his own little makeup place, barbershop makeup, and in South Central actually. And there's just a ha there's just a neighborhood there now, but uh, you know, hundred over a hundred years ago, I guess there was maybe a little uh, village or something, but um, South Central. Uh, and then um, he kind of opens it up, and again, perfect timing and luck. 
meets Charlie Chaplin, Fatty Arbuckle, people in the movies, movie business. And this is very early. You know, this is, we're not at the feature film length yet. People are making reels and gags right now. Um, and, um, you know, and he starts kind of making a name for himself because he realizes, this is, this is what I mean by good timing. This is when people need a different kind of makeup. So we've looked at, um, you know, we looked at the taboo of being an actor on film. That was, that was very lowbrow. You know, you did theater. But then when movies became a little bit more um, cooler, for lack of a better word, people were like, okay, maybe, maybe this thing is a legitimate business we can be in. And they didn't have the makeup. They had makeup for the stage. But this kind of ma this kind of makeup for the stage would cr this was fine because the audience was way away from the seats. But now that you have the camera and the close up or whatever, um, the makeup would crack and it would it would make their faces look clownish and you could see all of the uh, imperfections. And we just can't have any of this. Um, so he invents something called flexible grease paint. This is his genius to to Hollywood to um, and also I mean I say the world because everyone the whole world looks at Hollywood I mean they still look at Hollywood I mean TMZ you wouldn't have that we're always looking at Hollywood for better or worse and that's where people sometimes get their influences so he did change the world in that way so with flexible grease paint he was able to make the actors look more like human beings on the camera so again they needed they needed him and it was great timing for him to uh, and it, it took a lot of work. I mean, hours and hours of, I mean, of, in the back of his studio. Um, and he had a few different businesses after South Central. He moved to downtown and Hill Street. And, I mean, he worked so hard on his craft, craft to get what the actors needed on screen. Not just with the, it started with the makeup, but then also with the hair and with wigs. And with Cecil B. DeMille Squawman, they needed Indians. And so he would actually use human hair wigs and that would uh you know i mean despite it being racist uh, okay uh that solved a lot of problems for oh okay this guy actually knows wigs too studios wanted to just buy him out and, and have him work full time he was smart he said no no no. i'm you're gonna rent them out from me and i'm gonna sell to all the different stu studios but i'm not gonna i will only work for myself and um made him one of the first multi-millionaires uh in hollywood so he becomes so rich, uh, he finally opens up in 1935, this is just a few years before he dies, the four-story Art Deco building that's still there, actually. It's a Hollywood museum, which I've never been to, and I, I was reading about it. Maybe we should, we should go. Um, and uh, it's at 1660 North Highland, and, um, and that whole building is uh, used for his makeup and his products and there were different rooms that you could go in and they had the lighting already there for you to try out the products i mean um there's so many other little things makeup inventions that he came out with he was the, he was the beginner of he started this whole thing and made everybody glamorous from gene harlow's platinum hair style to um clara bow's bob to lucille ball's uh false eyelashes and her red curls um just uh, and and made it a family business. His son, his son came in and quickly changed his name to Max Factor Jr. And um, the business is still owned by the Max Factor family. Um, so it's I just thought it was interesting to see this. So he dies in 1938, but he wins an Oscar in 1929 uh, for best makeup. Um, and uh, I just thought it's interesting to see the development of cinema. We've talked about the cameras and the directors and the people that were responsible in the early um, early 20th century of movie making. Well, you know, so much of this is how people look, obviously. So he was able to, to invent something for people to really to look great. And those starlets, I mean, no doubt they look so beautiful. So there's a little, little history on Max Factor and his makeup business. So... That's the life of Max Factor. His big philosophy was that any woman could be glamorous. Just you just need the right tools. Yeah, I guess I guess that's true. Uh, I've seen some women that maybe, yeah, all women are glamorous. Can be. You just need the right makeup and all those things. But what a um, what a genius he was. Came from nothing and was poor and just came over here, and um, 
took Hollywood by the storm and and was smart a smart businessman too because he's like no the studios come to me. you buy me out no I buy you out the studios come to me you know and I'll do the work for you so very smart uh, great business guy and such a talent very cool to see that transition from oh no like what makeup are we going to use for the for the stars now that they're in the movies you know and when the movies came out nobody thought that that was that they people thought that was a fad just like when rock and roll came out people were like this, this is not going to last i mean variety magazine said rock and roll will be over by 1955. Um, charlie chaplin said movies are just a fad no one's going to be nobody wants to watch movies so it's interesting to, to think that, I mean, how wrong these people were about things. So uh, Max Factor was a great, great guy to, to write, write at the right timing, moment, and talent. Okay, so uh, tomorrow, film scoring results for Deer Hunter. I've said it all and too much. Love you guys and see you tomorrow. Okay, bye.